If, if you picked out, say, one one film, the, the films that you've made over the years, mm -hmm. um, as a film that you'd like to say to people, well, that's that's mm -hmm. what I can do. What, what would it be and what, what, what is it about it that you think makes well, it so special? Well, I think there are three. Um, uh, actually, there are four. There's Namib, which was the first. Every single frame in that, particularly the Scenex, is a work of art. You could make a poster of it and put it on your wall. It, the photography is stunning. It also shows you a place you didn't know existed that you couldn't imagine existed, and it gets steadily stranger as you go through the film. Uh, we managed to get the story to work, and we managed to find the right kind of music. We used Pink Floyd and uh, Structure Sonair, which was people playing on glass t um, rods, I think, um, and we a man called Stomu Yamashita. And all, it all came off record, and we had to clear it. And it was in the days before we commissioned Especially written music was the sheer difficulty of clearing the rights on that music that made me decide it got to be easier just to write your own music and be done with it. So there's that one, which I just think is a, you know I would love to have I would love to see it remastered now. Um, there's um, the uh, Siaru film, which is a, a description of a place and how it works is quite flawless, and again it's got stunning pictures. And then there's the, the Otters of Yellowstone, which never really, to me, got the um, uh, kind of recognition that it deserved. Fred said that Fred Kaufman of uh, WNET ran it in January and got the seventh highest rating that month on PBS. Um, but it's Bob Landis, who is not in the same league as um, either... Uh, David Hughes or Jim Clare or Richard Foster as an artistic photographer but has got more staying power than anybody I've ever met has actually managed to film Wild Otters and there's not a setup shot in there um, in Yellowstone and he's got them particularly at the beginning of the film sliding on their stomachs and the music is just right and you get the joy of these animals and they're just wonderful animals and it makes me feel good to look at it so those are the three of them and uh, the fourth one is Seasons of the Sea, which was the first underwater film that I'd seen, which is almost entirely underwater, which I didn't feel like I had been drowned or taken out and left, uh, you know, in the water. And again, stunning pictures. Do you think any of these films will have changed the audience in their attitudes towards wildlife? I think it will have added to their knowledge. And I, I know that during the existence of Partridge, a lot of legislation came into being, a lot of attitudes did change. Um, when I showed these films, particularly things like Corrup and uh, Silver Verdi, um, which explained about habitats, and also the third program for Dr. Vanga Julia the Kalahari, um, it actually showed people things that we were talking about. Instead of giving them the benefit of our opinions, we could actually show them. We had an example in the Okavango film where you saw, um, first of all, a wildebeest, then a springbok eating grass, and you saw that they bit the grass and left the roots, and then you saw a cow, which doesn't have any teeth in its upper jaw, getting hold of it and ripping it out, and just seeing, you know, the roots and the sod coming out of the ground um, gave the audience, particularly the Botswana audience, an example of what we were talking about, because they didn't know what the hell we were talking about. Why? What's the difference between cows? Cows eat grass and the other animals eat grass. So what's the problem? Well, you could. the problem was there in one picture. And they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, they'd had 10,000 words on it, but the picture is actually what made them sort of understand. And there was a complete change of attitude by the government there. And same with the Belize government, we showed them various things, and that, apparently that series, which was um, made for Channel 4, which was called uh, Path of the Rain God, um, that actually was compulsory viewing for all the cabinet and cabinet ministers in the Belize government. So yes, you've got, to, you've got to get people to evoke what you're talking about. If you lecture them, they switch off. So you've got these pictures, beautiful pictures of a beautiful place, and not too much, now look, it's all going to disappear, because we already know that. 
got to actually get them to care about it. So I think it, they did something. Yeah. Has the technology, the changes in technology, enabled you to reveal more? Oh, I think so. I mean, what with laparoscopes and endoscopes and uh, being able to, you know, ever more sophisticated lenses and all that kind of thing, you can see more and more. The question is, what do you do with that information? And of course, cameras like this one, you know, and generally the whole advantage of things like uh, DigiBeta. So if you've got a wild dog burrow and you want a mum bringing the pup out, you lock the camera off and you leave it running to have a cup of tea. <laughs> and then you have a look and see if it's there. And if it's not there, you rewind and start again. And if it is there, you drop that bit in. And, you know, film is very expensive. So, yeah, I think it, it's easier now to get the amazing shots if you want them. But the question is, what do you do with them? Because if you go down the John Downer route, you, eventually the film is about the technology and not about the subject. 